Carolyn Taylor, and uh, I'm the director of the Institute for Values-Based Leadership here at Royal Roads University, and in the leader in the School of Leadership Studies. Um, and I'm here to welcome you warmly to this evening, those of you here in the uh, Dialogue Center at Royal Roads, and also a number of you online, actually across Canada and I think around the world. Um, it's my pleasure to, for, for, before I, 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 I welcome Richard, I want to give a big thank you to uh, Lauren Garvey and, and uh, Carol Foxton from the Leadership School and, and Dave uh, Adams from our media group in managing this assembly virtually and in person of great people and great ideas. Um, and I want also to, uh, to thank Richard for offering his uh, time and talent to, to our community um, uh, around the whole question of building a values-based, a values-driven nation. Um, Richard uh, and I are uh, dear friends and colleagues uh, from about four years ago. Um, and he is uh, an adjunct professor in the Institute and the Leadership School here. He's also teaching in our Certificate for Values-Based Leadership, which is currently in progress. And uh, he is the founder and uh, uh, chair, chairman of the uh, Barrett Value Center, uh, located in the, U in the UK and the US. Uh, he also is the author of the Cultural Transformation Tools, which has enabled um, people around the world in, I think, 90 countries and uh, about 3,000 organizations to um, help us grab on to this elusive, a formerly elusive thing called culture. Um, he's also a uh, member of the Royal Society in the UK. He's also a visiting lecture to the Said uh, School of Business at Oxford University. Uh, he is also an adjunct professor at Exeter University in the MBA program. He comes with a lot of experience and uh, a wonderful um, human being uh, to talk to us tonight about values, uh, values-driven nation. And this in the context of a world uh, where, uh, just an example locally, uh, the BC Business Council uh, in Brit uh, you know, did a, a whole sounding in British Columbia about what's going on with people and how they're living and, and, and their concerns and found that we are grossly lacking uh, confidence in not only business but government. Uh, and that's not a, a you think thing unique to BC. Uh, it's across our country, across the world. It's a very important time, and sometimes it's the moment of greatest, um, a great, greatest crisis, as they say, uh, that gives us opportunities to actually break through and uh, create new ways of thinking, new ways of leading, and better cultures to live and work in. So thank you, Richard, for coming. Uh, it's a very great pleasure to introduce you here tonight. Thank you, Marlon. Good evening, everybody. Uh, anybody came last year? Uh, didn't we have fun last year? <laughs> Let's hope we have as much fun this year. So the topic, building a values-driven nation. Where do we begin? I begin with a question. And the question is, why, in some of the world's oldest democracies, in an era in which democracy as a form of government has triumphed, is public confidence in political leaders and institutions of democratic governments at a near all-time low. Why is that so? People are becoming more and more skeptical about politicians, less attached to political parties, and less trusting of government institutions. And that's pretty much true throughout the whole of Western democracy. You know, the opportunity to get involved in democracy is so low. I mean, I get to vote 
it takes me 10 minutes um, uh, once every four years. And that's it. I'm done. That's it. That's my participation. And I, I, and I find that a scandal. Um, I want my voice heard in the way that my community and my nation is run. And what, this is hap what, what is happening is that this is causing apathy among the voting public. Um, the level of trust in politicians and in the institutions of government is at an all-time low everywhere in the Western democracies. These are not, not my conclusions, although uh, these are things that I've been thinking about, but these are thinking, the conclusions of many academics throughout the world. And I recommend this book, Disaffected D Democracies. Um, it is a very salutary reading when you read about how disaffected we all are with our pres present political system. And I think the issue it really is, is that there's a value shift. The modern democracies are built on power and authority. And, and these are the words that politicians they lose. They say we're running, we want to, we're running for power. They're not, they don't say we are running to serve the needs of the public. They seem more interested in, in the needs of their political parties than of the public that they represent. And so in a sense, what we have is we've got a new elite. I mean, we had kings and queens, and then we got democracies, and now we have these new political elites who um, think that once they're elected, they're in power and not in service not in service to the people. It's a really sad state of affairs. And then you watch how they perform in government. In Canada, can you see uh, the workings of parliament on TV? Can you see it? Yeah. I don't know what it's like in Canada, but, but I can tell you what it's like in the UK. It's like a bunch of schoolboys constantly blaming each other if they could put all half of the energy that they put into these so-called debates into caring about the people, we'd be in a better place. But it's constantly scoring points off each other, putting each other down. Frankly, I think it's ridiculous. I mean, these are grown-up people, and the way they behave is scandalous, and we elect them. Whew. I really feel upset about that. So, meanwhile, these people are locked into power and wanting to rule. They work on, they, they, they have these popularity contests. We call them elections. And, uh, and the rest of the people who are voting, the rest of us, have kind of moved on. We're not stuck at that level of consciousness anymore. We, we've moved on. We, we've individuated and we're self-actualizing and we want to have a say, more of a say. We want to be able to have our voice heard. We don't want to be feeding these powerful elites. And I don't know how it is here in Canada, but in the United Kingdom, every two or three months there's a scandal with a high-ranking politician. Uh, cheating. Lying. Let's not mention, even mention sex. You know, the, it's, it's going on all the time. Uh, these are high-ranking people in our government, and they're behaving without integrity. They lack authenticity. 
there's a real issue of leadership in the political domain. They're not servant leaders. They don't realize that their job is to serve the people who elect them. They serve their parties. And again, you know, the West form, in my opinion, of political democracy is a two-party system like there is in the USA and to a certain extent in, in, in UK. We've got our first coalition government in many, many years. But the two-party system is like, okay, so we can either vote for the black people or we can vote for the white people. I don't mean in terms of color or race, but, you know, the policies, although they're quite close, there's no, there are no, I hesitate to use this word nowadays, there's no shades of grey. <laughs> so the populace has moved on and yet we're left with this system which really doesn't work for us anymore. So how do we build a better world? Because definitely the world is in a mess. What do we need to focus on? Well, let's just take a look throughout history. Throughout human history, individuals and societies have always focused their energies consciously or subconsciously on a central key idea that if sufficient energy and effort were devoted to it, it would help them move towards a more idealized future. A future that would, have some, would in some way make their individual and collective life experience better and alleviate their fears. And so what we're seeing is an evolution, an evolution of consciousness. For a long time, we were involved in physical evolution. And then Homo sapiens came along, and we shifted from physical evolution to consciousness evolution. You know, we're not evolving an extra hand or an extra finger. No, what what's happening now is evolution is about consciousness. And I have a model of seven levels of consciousness, and I'm not going to go into it in detail, but you can read about it. But basically, it starts off with survival. Now, if we go back 10, 20, 30,000 years, we existed as Homo sapiens, as hunters and gatherers, and development in that society was ways to improve survival. You know, they made, they made <laughs> decisions collectively which helped them to improve their survival and then after that era we moved into the agricultural area and we developed tribalism and so now uh, we had ownership of land and ownership of agricultural resources and the only way we could survive would be to protect that and so what we had to do was we had we, we got to the idea of development as safety and after that came the era of the, of power of these, uh, the Greeks and the Romans and who went off and, and, and conquered many lands and, uh, uh, and they wanted, the, the way they operated was through fear. And so that was development as power um, when it was at its high state. And then gradually, over time, we went through many other changes, but we got to, in recent years, development as democracy. And democracy evolved, you know, if you go back to the Magna Carta, uh, the, the barons uh, that, uh, that uh, were surrounded uh, King John, uh, said, look, you know, we've had enough of this. You know, we want, we want to have some equal rights here. And from that moment on, we began to see, at least in the Western world, more and more people involved in making decisions. And f first it was the elites, the, uh, the, the landowners, and gradually it came down to the people. And, and, and finally, only uh, less than 100 years ago, my dear friends, women, got the vote. We got to equality. Um, and this seemed to be uh, a very significant improvement. And it was a very significant improvement. Because as I will discuss in a few moments, there are different levels of democracy. So 
as we got, got into de development as democracy, out of that came the idea of development as economic growth. And that is a pretty much the predominant idea now driving development, driven but mostly by the World Bank and, and uh, all of the powerful institutions around the world. But what we're seeing more now is ideas such as development as human well-being, which is proposed by the United Nations, and development as human happiness. There was a conference on that last year. And what I believe is that we need to put development within the context of the evolution of human values. Move beyond all of these other stages of development and really understand that development is about human evolution. And once we say it's about human evolution, it's about what we as human beings value. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the rest of this presentation. But first, I just want to show you this little video. Hi, my name is Jenny, I'm a sophomore, and this is for all three of you. Can you say in one sentence or less what, <laughs> um, you know what I mean. Can you say why America is the greatest country in the world? Diversity and opportunity. Lewis? Uh, freedom and freedom, so let's keep it that way. Well, the New York Jets. <laughs> no, I'm going to hold you to an answer on that. What makes America the greatest country in the world? Well, Lewis and Sharon said it. Diversity and opportunity and freedom and freedom. I'm not letting you go back to the airport without answering a question. Well, our Constitution is a masterpiece. James Madison was a genius. The Declaration of Independence is, for me, the single greatest piece of American writing. You don't look satisfied. One's a set of laws and the other's a declaration of war. I want a human moment from you. What about the people? Why is America not the greatest, greatest country, country in the world, Professor? That's my answer. You're saying yes. yes. Let's talk about fine. The Sharon, the NEA is a loser. Yeah, it accounts for a penny out of our paycheck, but he gets to hit you with it any time he wants. It doesn't cost money. It costs votes. It costs airtime and column inches. You know why people don't like liberals? Because they lose. If liberals are so fucking smart, how come they lose so goddamn always? Hey, and with a straight face, you're going to tell students that America is so star-spangled awesome that we're the only ones in the world who have freedom? Canada has freedom. Japan has freedom. The UK, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Australia, Belgium has freedom. So 207 sovereign states in the world, like 180 of them have freedom. All right. And yeah, you, uh, sorority girl, just in case you accidentally wander into a voting booth one day, there's some things you should know. And one of them is there is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, third in median household income, number four in labor force, and number four in exports. We lead the world in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita, number of adults who believe angels are real, and defense spending, where we spend more than the next 26 countries combined, 25 of whom are allies. Now, none of this is the fault of a 20-year-old college student, but you nonetheless are, without a doubt, a member of the worst period, generation period ever, period. So when you ask what makes us the greatest country in the world, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yosemite? Sure used to be. We stood up for what was right. We fought for moral reasons. We passed laws, struck down laws for moral reasons. We waged wars on poverty, not poor people. We sacrificed, we cared about our neighbors. We put our money where our mouths were and we never beat our chest. We built great big things, made ungodly 
technological advances, explored the universe, cured diseases, and we cultivated the world's greatest artists and the world's greatest economy. We reached for the stars, acted like men. We aspired to intelligence. We didn't belittle it. It didn't make us feel inferior. We didn't identify ourselves by who we voted for in the last election, and we didn't, we didn't scare so easy. <laughs> we were able to be all these things and do all these things because we were informed by great men, men who were revered. First step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. Enough? So, it is my belief uh, that uh, in the UK, uh, democracy uh, is not alive and well because uh, in the most part is hijacked by the establishment. We have the House of Lords, which is not elected. Who are these people who are governing us, who we have not elected? In the USA, the whole democratic process has been hijacked by the rich elites. It's a sorry state. In 2008, in August, uh, we mapped the values of Iceland. And uh, the result that we got is shown uh, here. These white dots represent potentially limiting values. These are the top 10 values that the people of Iceland see in their nation. Materialistic, short-term focus, uncertainty about the future, corruption, elitism, wasted resources, gender discrimination and blame. I was quite shocked when I saw that. They only had two positive values in their top 10, educational opportunities and material needs. Now, Iceland is, according to the Economic Intelligence Unit, the most uh, advanced democracy on the planet. And they have something called cultural entropy. We measured it. It's the proportion of votes that people gave to these limiting values. So we asked over 2,000 people, what are, the, what are your personal values? What values do you see in your nation? What values would you like to see in your nation? And in the response to the, what values would you like to see in your nation, this is what we got. 53% of the votes were for these limiting values. We call that cultural entropy. It's the degree of dysfunction in the nation. This was August 2008. In September 2008, um, I went to present the results to, in Iceland and was on radio and TV with our local uh, collaborators who'd financed the, uh, the survey. And I said, you know, there's, you have some issues here, issues of leadership, but more importantly, if you were an organization, and we've mapped the values of thousands of organizations, I said, if you were an organization with this result, you'd be going bankrupt about now. Two weeks later, Iceland went bankrupt. It was at that point I began to realize how, how important this tool was in nations. We'd been, we'd been working with many organizations all over the world, but we were just beginning to experiment with nations. Um, in about the same period, we'd, over three years, uh, this is the result for 2010, we mapped the values of the USA. Uh, nine out of the top ten values in the current culture are potentially limiting. Bureaucracy, corruption, blame, uncertainty about the future, wasted resources, you can read them all. Cultural entropy, 53%, 58%. 50, 58% of all of the votes for the values that people saw in their nation were these potentially limiting values. And this is what you get when you focus on development as economic growth. So cultural entropy, it's a key measure 
It measures the level of anxiety, fear, unhappiness, frustration that people feel about being able to meet their needs in the environment or context in which they live. We developed this concept when working with organizations. But it applies to communities and to nations. Now let's take a look at Canada. Okay, this should be, say, 2009, not 2012. And what we see here is uh, one to five out of the top ten values are potentially limiting. Bureaucracy, wasted resources, unemployment, crime. However, on the other side, we have human rights, freedom of speech, law enforcement, quality of life, all made the top ten. Not such a high level of elevated cultural entropy, although I do believe in now it would be higher. This was, as I said, 2009. By the way, uh, this particular survey was uh, financed and run by the Values Based Institute uh, for Leadership right here in uh, Victoria. And we worked with Marilyn to do that. Now, uh, just uh, at the end of last year, we mapped the values of the United Arab Emirates. And I was amazed to see that the level of cultural entropy in the United Arab Emirates is only 12%. And in other words, people here are quite happy. And the top 10 values were all positive. Look at them. Number one value in the nation is concern for future generations. We actually uh, had a very large sample, more than we needed to be statistically sim significant, uh, over 4,000 people, uh, roughly half of them were people, Emirati, the local people, and the other half were um, many of the guest workers who worked there. And the interesting thing is, they both saw the nation ex almost exactly the same. We had almost the same result, whether you were a local or whether you were a visitor and lived there. This really got to me along with this result, which we'd measured in 2008. The level of cultural entropy in Bhutan, which focuses on gross national happiness, is 4%. These are really happy people. Top 10 values, my goodness, look at, take a look at that. Continuous improvement, environmental protection, moral religious codes, political rights, etc., etc. Now the interesting thing to me was that here we had, with the UAE and with the Bhutan, two authoritarian regimes, not democracies, with these pretty amazing results. People are happy. Their needs are being met. So this is very interesting. Now when we compare cultural entropy percentages across Europe, where we've mapped the values of all of these nations, this is what we see. One of the lowest, the lowest ones, as you might expect, are, are in the, are in the uh, Scandinavian countries. Uh, we mapped the values of the United Kingdom uh, just uh, very recently, came out at 59%. Uh, every, every value in the top 10 is potentially limiting. People are really frustrated, unhappy with what they see in their nation. And here we see the rest of the world. Uh, that was just Europe. And here we see Canada. Um, and uh, it's a sorry story. So I began to say to myself, well, what is it? What is cultural entropy linked to? Uh, so on this diagram here, I've mapped cultural entropy. These are the, bar, the vertical bars. Uh, sorry. Uh, 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 sorry. Yeah, no, <laughs> the vertical bars are the democracy index, um, uh, which are the established by the Economic Intelligence Unit. They have a way of measuring the level of democracy. And so, um, uh, until I came across this, I thought like democracy was sort of sort of like a, a plateau, a, you know, one size fits all. It isn't. It isn't at all. Um, so, uh, as you see from this, Iceland uh, is one of the highest, has, has one of the highest levels of doc democracy, followed by Denmark, Sweden, Australia, Switzerland. And on the red, the red line uh, are the plots of the cultural entropy. So, what you would expect is low cultural entropy with high democracy. 
and high cultural entropy with low democracy, but it doesn't fit any pattern at all. And so I thought, well, let me take another look. Let me look at the uh, Human Development Index of the United Nations, and that's again is the vertical bars, and th on the red dots are, the, uh, are basically the levels of cultural entropy. And again, there is absolutely no fit. There's no agreement between human development and the level of cultural entropy. So what I found out was that cultural entropy is not related to the level of democracy, it's not related to the level of development, and it's not related to the size of the country. You can live in a full liberal democracy with an advanced level of development in a small or large country and still experience high levels of cultural entropy. So what is it that this cultural entropy represents? It's, I believe it's a direct reflection of the character and the quality of leadership of an organization, community or nation, and the amount of care and attention that leaders give to meeting the needs of the people in their organization, community or nation, as opposed to meeting their own needs. It's about leadership. Low entropy signifies that people's needs are being met, High entropy signifies that people's needs are not being met. We did this study with uh, Hewitt. They measure staff engagement. It's a really important measure in organizations to find out uh, how well the organization is operating. And we mapped 163 organizations um, in Australia. And at the same time, we measured engagement with entropy. And what we found was this relationship uh, which is very clear that when you have a high sense of engagement, people feel committed and enthusiastic about the company, they have low, the company has low levels of cultural entropy. They're not frustrated, they're very happy. However, when you have low levels of engagement, you will find high levels of cultural entropy. And it's, it's a very solid relationship. So what did I do? I then thought, well, let me just take a look at people's trust in government leaders. And there's various data from around the world. So the, um, the level of cultural entropy in this case is, are the vertical bars and the percentage of people in the nation not having any trust in the nation are the red dots or the red lines. So that in Italy, 73% uh, people don't trust politicians or government leaders and they have a um, high level of cultural entropy, almost the same level. Um, in the UK, we've got 59% cultural entropy and 66% uh, of the people do not trust government leaders. But what I'm beginning to see here is a relationship between cultural entropy and leadership. So I believe that cultural entropy is a measure of the level of anxiety or fear or unhappiness or frustration that people feel about being able to meet their basic needs and satisfy their growth needs. In other words, get, have, or experience what they value in the environment and context in which they live. And the degree to which they're able to meet these basic and growth needs um, means that it will be low entropy. The degree to which they cannot meet these needs will bring high levels of entropy. Now, you feel anxious and fearful if your basic needs are not being met, but once they are met, you turn your focus to satisfying your growth needs. This is, this is work from Abraham Maslow. This is his basic needs and growth needs. And so what is it? Now, we've got our se seven levels of consciousness model. As I said, I'm not going to go into detail about that, but let's look at what our basic needs are. At the first level of consciousness, survival, it's about satisfying your physiological needs for security, staying alive, and keeping your body healthy about satisfying your emotional need for belonging and protection and connection and satisfying your emotional need to be recognized for your skills, talents and qualities. These are basic needs that we all have and when these needs are not satisfied we feel anxious and fearful. Once we've satisfied these needs we can move into our growth needs, satisfying our need for autonomy and freedom, independence and adventure, satisfying our need for authenticity and finding meaning and purpose in life, satisfying your need to actualize your purpose by influencing or impacting the world around you, and satisfying your need to leave a legacy, to have led a life of significance that will be remembered. So in some sense, these needs 
represent the seasons of our lives. You know, you begin your life trying to satisfy your basic needs, and then as you begin to do that, you begin to say, oh, there, must, there must be more to life than having two houses and six cars, self-esteem, level three, what's, what's my meaning? And we be, move to level four, and level five. So these are our basic needs and growth needs. And there are three factors that determine what you value at any given moment in time. So the, your level of psychological development, the context in which you live, and the situation you are experiencing. So your level of psychological development, where you've reached in the sense of your evolution of consciousness, determines what you get happy about and what you value. And the context in which you live and the level of fear and trust you have about being able to get, have or experience what you value, that conditions your level of happiness. So, stages of psychological development, surviving, meeting your physiological needs, keeping safe and nurtured, staying loyal to your family, kin and culture, Finding ways to separate yourself from your peers by excelling at what you do best. These are the first three stages of psychological development. These are the first three stages that all children and teenagers go through. We all go through that. And then we move into the next stage, which is individuating. We begin to let go of the cultural and parental conditioning, which no longer serves us. And we begin to find out who we really are, what we really value, not what was taught to us when we were growing up. And then we move into self-actualization, aligning fully with who you are so that you can become all you can become. And once you've begun that process of self-actualization and you've found your sense of purpose, a sense of mission, you really want to do that everywhere. And so you begin to align with other people with similar motivations and values so you can make a bigger difference in the world. And we call that integrating. And then we move to serving. Fulfilling your destiny by using your gifts to give back to the world. So, what do we value at different stages of our development? Our values are not fixed. They change over time as we move through these different stages of psychological development. But some values will always be, uh, we will always hold. So, let's, so, so they, we have some values that change, and some values that remain with us forever. So what is it that we value at the survival level? A safe environment, income and benefits that are sufficient to take care of our needs and the needs of our families. So if there's a lot of unemployment and we can't do this, we begin to operate at the survival level of consciousness automatically because we, you, that's what we have to take care of. Um, at the relationship level, we want a caring environment free from conflict and discrimination where people are loyal to the group and respect and care about each other. And at the third level of consciousness, we want opportunities to learn, grow and develop our skills and talents with support, feedback, coaching from people we trust. Now living in our Western democracies, these are many things that we take for granted, but in some nations around the world, uh, you know, nations which are governed by hard-fisted generals and, and poor countries, it's really difficult to satisfy this set of needs. And you're really stuck at this level. Uh, and then you go look back into the USSR and you begin to realize that at this next level, opportunities to use our gifts and talents by being made accountable for challenging projects are processes of significance. It's in other words, when we get to wanting to achieve and wanting to be independent, in the USSR, that was suppressed the intelligentsia was locked up. They wanted to keep people in those first three levels of consciousness. And so that has changed now. And now we move to the next level of consciousness, internal cohesion, opportunities to lead a values and purpose-driven life that creates value for ourselves and others and supports the common good. As we move to the sixth level of consciousness, Opportunities to leverage our impact in the world by forming alliances with others who share the same values 
and a similar purpose. And then finally, opportunities to leave a legacy by serving the needs of humanity and building a better world for future generations. And until we've established a solid base of those first three levels, it's really difficult to jump off and work on finding meaning and making a difference in service. So at each stage of our psychological development, there are specific values and needs. What we value is what is missing in our lives. And what we value is what we consider to be really important and can't do without. And so as we grow and develop, our values change. So here, this is data from the UK, just from last year. Here are the age groups along the bottom. And these are the proportion of votes uh, in, in their personal values. What are you, pick 10 values that represent who you are. These are the proportion of votes for friendship and honesty by age. And what we see is that as people, young people, we value friendship. And then, as we begin to get our own families, uh, we don't need so much of that external connection. We get focused on our own families. So friendship drops. Uh, honesty, on the other hand, is interesting. It's not to say that people are dishonest, but it be as we go through life, we begin to recognize that being honest pays benefits. <laughs> And I think that little drop at the old age is simply that it's not that old people are less honest. They have other priorities, I think. <laughs> you know, they're sometimes finding it difficult to survive. Uh, so I don't want anybody to go away thinking that old people are dishonest. And it could be. Oh, yes. What a, yes. So now the second factor, the context you live in, it also affects our values. So let's just compare two people. One are born in a wealthy, educated family in a rich, liberal democracy, and one born in a poor, remote farming community run by iron-fisted generals. And you will see that uh, what, what you're able to achieve in your life is very much determined by that context. So the person in the rich liberal democracy would take the values of health and safety, survival and freedom and equality, that's the transformation level, they'd take those for granted. And they'd be pursuing those higher order things such as fairness, openness, transparency and trust. Meanwhile, the individual living in that poor authoritarian regime would be, have a daily focus on survival, safety and health. So the context we live in is also important. And finally, what's also important about our values is the situation that you are experiencing. So imagine for a moment that some of you, you know, lost your job, um, your investments went kaput, um, you were operating quite nicely at level four and five consciousness, and all of a sudden you drop down to survival. And so different, you have different priorities. And you know, when you get to the lowest levels of priorities, um, you know, you have competing values, you know, you, may, you might actually steal in order to survive. Right? So, depending on the context and depending on the experience that we're having or the situation, our values might change. What we value is, first of all, what is missing in our lives to satisfy our basic needs, and secondly, what we need in our lives to fulfill our growth needs. So, it depends on the stage we've reached in our psychological development, and whether we're happy or not, depends on our ability to get, have, or experience what we value in the context in which we live and in our current life conditions. So this is why the leaders of values-driven organizations, communities, and nations focus on what people want to meet their basic needs and find personal fulfillment, in other words, their growth needs. By meeting the needs of their people, values-driven organizations, communities, and nations engender high levels of engagement and commitment. And this is why values-driven organizations, communities, and nations are amongst the most successful in the world. Because they release all of that commitment and energy that people have because they feel at ease in their culture and they feel valued. So here's uh, some little research that I did. It's coming out in a new book, The Values-Driven Organization. What I did was I took the top 40 best companies to work for, in other words, companies that focus on employee needs, and I compared their uh, 
investment in those companies with the S&P 500, which are just basic average good companies. And what we see is the average annualized return for these best companies to work for is 16, over 16 percent, whereas for the S&P 500, it's only 4 percent. In other words, what's happening here, these best companies to work for, are engaging their employees, high sense of engagement, and therefore they're releasing commitment, enthusiasm, and creativity, and a willingness to go the extra mile. Now imagine if we could do that in our nations, the nations with high entropy, if we could do that. So here is the conclusion I've come to, and I only really came to this in the last uh, year or so. You don't need to operate as a democracy to engender the goodwill and support of your people, but you do need to operate with democratic values. Because democratic values represent the values of individuation and self-actualization. I'll show what I mean by that in a moment. And the stages, these are the stages of psychological development that are now most prevalent in the world. The level of income around the world has gone up and people have been able to meet their basic needs and now they're looking to satisfy their growth needs. And they're starting to individuate, decide what it is that is important to them because they can become independent of the cultures in which they were brought up. So the next big question is what are democratic values? What values do we need to focus on if we want a values-driven nation or a values-driven organization? Well, I want to just to say, hold that question, but let's just go back to the concept of evolution in a moment. Before I do that, let me just define what values are for me. Values are a shorthand method of describing what is important to us individually and collectively at any given moment in time. So your values might change over time depending on psychological development, context, and situation. So the collective values that people hold in a nation not only represent the average level of psychological development they have reached, they also represent the state of evolution of human consciousness in that nation. And if we now look at evolution, and this is where we had so much fun last year, and if you don't, those of you who are here will remember we discussed this concept of evolution, um, if we look back 14 billion years, there are principles to evolution that are important at the atomic level, the cellular level, and the level of creatures in other Homo sapiens. And at all of those levels of existence, there are three stages. First of all, you have to become viable and independent in your framework of existence. If you're not viable and independent, you won't survive. That applies to an atom a cell, a giraffe, a fox, a human being, you've got to become viable and independent. Now, as the context in which you live becomes more threatening, more difficult, how do you survive? You survive by moving to stage two, which is bonding to form a group entity. Entities bond with each other to create viable, independent group structures. So atoms bonded to form molecules. Now, the next stage is as life conditions become even more complex, these group structures now have to cooperate with each other to create a higher order entity. Otherwise, they won't survive. And so atoms bonded together to form molecules, molecules cooperated to create cells. Cells bonded together to form organisms, organisms cooperated to form creatures. One of those creatures, Homo sapiens, is learning how to become viable and independent, move, satisfy their basic needs, bond together to form group structures, nations, and those nations are now learning how to cooperate to create a higher order entity called humanity. But we're not getting there. And the reason we're not getting there is because we can't cooperate. Our leaders are so wrapped up in their ego existence, they cannot see the bigger picture. The problems of existence are global. The institutions we have for dealing with them are national. The United Nations is very ineffective in this domain. And it's because, simply because of our politicians. 
that we can't build this better world. The ego-driven nature of our political institutions in our leading Western democracies. I believe our present politicians have a lot to answer for. And the issue is leadership. They're operating at that level three level of consciousness. It's about me. It's about my political party. It's about power. It's not about the common good. That's where we are. Something has to give. So what are, we can apply these stages of evolution to the seven levels of consciousness, either at a personal level, an organizational level, or a national level. And if we apply it to a nation, we're talking about bonding to form a cohesive group structure. That's what we're trying to do with democracy. Democracy begins at the level four consciousness, and the highest levels of democracy go through to level five consciousness. And there are seven values that must be in place in order for you to have a high level of democracy. And each value depends on the previous value in order for it to establish. So the first value is freedom. There's a little point in, in, in trying to develop equality if you haven't got freedom. And you've got to have freedom before you go for equality. And once you've got equality, then you want accountability for the freedom and uh, equality. After accountability comes fairness, openness, transparency, and trust. And in Love, Fear, and the Destiny of Nations, I, I write a whole chapter about each one of these progressive values that we have, we need to uh, bring into our nations in order to live a high level of democracy. And I did a little survey in Sweden, uh, UK, and uh, uh, USA to see to what extent these seven values were present. So on the left hand side, you've got freedom. Uh, the gray is US, the blue in the middle is UK, and the dark blue is Sweden. And you will see in every case except the one, the first one, that Sweden has a higher score in these values. And the, first, the only reason it doesn't, the, the only one where it doesn't is freedom. Freedom in the UK is something that's really considered to be sacrosanct. But in every other case, Sweden is higher, and in every other case, UK is higher than USA. And do you know what the lowest one is all of these is? Whether you're talking about Sweden, UK, or US? Accountability. Our leaders are not accountable. We have a situation in the UK now which is absolutely, in my opinion, terrible. There is a hospital in the middle of the country which let many patients die, and patients lived in terrible conditions. I mean, you read about it. Go to look at Staffordshire, look it up on the internet, and it is shocking. The person who was the head of Staffordshire hospital area is now the head of the National Health Service. And people are demanding he be accountable. Last week, the trustees of the National Health Service met and confirmed him as leader still. I mean, this is absolutely shocking. No accountability. Three years ago, was it four years ago in the UK, we had this expenses scandal. I don't know whether you read about it, but four MPs went to prison for fiddling their expenses, and hundreds of others were doing it same, but not as seriously. And these are the people we elect to governors? No integrity? And then we have the House of Lords, which is there. These are not elected people. I do expect to get shot when I go home. I, I'm actually, I'm not sure that things are that much different here in Canada. Well, when we look at 
cultural entropy and we link it to these democratic values scores that we just saw, we see that cultural entropy is lowest in Sweden, which is, has the highest democratic values of those seven we said. And the high, and UK and US have high levels of entropy, but they have low levels of democratic values. So how do you build a values-driven nation? Um, I'm going to take the example of Canada, but first of all, I want to speak about the United Arab Emirates. And I want to speak about the United Arab Emirates because I've been out there twice now in the last three months, and the leaders of the UAE have said, we want to build a values-driven nation. The first nation that I've ever come across that said, we want to build a values-driven nation, and we want you to help us do that. Remember, they had 10 positive values, they had 12% entropy, 10 positive values in their top 10. And the, uh, the cabinet, um, the prime minister is actually the ruler of Dubai, he's also vice president of UAE. The cabinet have said, yeah, come and do us values, a, a values workshop with us. And let's build a values driven nation, the first values driven nation on the planet. That's interesting, because a lot of the Gulf states look to Dubai and look to the UAE because they're being so successful. I have been so impressed by, in my visits to the UAE. I'm so impressed about women. They're everywhere, in, working in all places. I mean, this is a Muslim country, but women are highly respected, and they're in every meeting, and they're in positions of power. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm just overwhelmed with this possibility of helping this nation to become the first values-driven nation on the planet. And maybe others will follow. But then the question is, how do we do that? Well, I'm just going to give you the case for Canada and what it would look like if you were to build a values-driven nation in Canada. So the first thing we would do, and we did it in 2009, but we'd have to redo it basically, is do a map, measure the values of the nation, what people see in the nation. They pick 10 values about what, who they are, 10 values about how their nation operates, 10 values how they'd like to see it to operate. And with that data, we could then begin to hold discussions, nationwide dialogues to discuss the results of the values assessment have people in every uh, province talking about the value jumps, the values that occurred in the current culture that they wanted more of in their desired culture, and what they wanted less of. What were the highest scoring potentially limiting values? Well, how can we reduce them? We want to people to tell us what they want more of and what they want less of. In other words, what they value. And that's why I'm talking about building a values-driven nation. If you understand what people value, then you can build a nation around their values. So what do people in Canada want more of? Well, when we looked at the results of the survey from 2009, in the current culture, uh, accountability got 112 votes out of this sample of about 1,000. The desired culture, it got 511 votes. Uh, that is a jump of 399. That was the biggest values jump. So, like at UK and those other countries, accountability is an issue in Canada. So when we look at these, these are leadership issues. Accountability, government effectiveness, honesty, and effective healthcare. These are all leadership issues that need to be addressed. And when we look at the others, they're basically policy issues. Affordable housing, caring for the elderly, poverty reduction, caring for the disadvantaged. So there's two strings to this bow. There's the leadership part and there's the policy part. Now the next step after that is to use the results of the values assessment and the values dialogue for inspiration to choose three or four values that represent the nation. What do you want your nation to stand for? What do you want people to think of when they hear the word Canada? What do you want the people of Canada to have or experience in their lives? What is it that differentiates Canada from other countries? 
What an interesting dialogue and discussion that would be to have in every province and every community. And then for the short-term results, we need to focus on the government's internal operations and external relationships with citizens. We need to carry out values assessment of every government ministry. The United Arab Emirates have agreed to do that. Every ministry will be party to a values assessment of their organization. So carry out a government-wide cultural values assessment. Implement cultural change process. Implement leadership development programs to, to change the culture and monitor that on an annual basis. And in the long term, we need to think about values-based education. Bringing values-based education to all our schools. This is a high priority in the United Arab Emirates. They realized that they need to bring this, if they're going to build a values-driven nation, it's not just about the people who are old or middle-aged, it's about the young people too. The number one value in the current culture of the UAE is future generations. Their concern for future generations. So that's basically where I want to leave it. If you want to read more, these are a couple of my books. I keep on writing books, I can't stop, uh, that deal with the topics that you've got here. Um, this whole presentation, you'll find it on SlideShare, uh, Barrett Values. If you want to find more, you can go to our website and you can always send me an email message. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Now I'm quite happy to take comments and questions. Anybody has anything to say? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm wondering if some of the positive values that you uh, noted on the slide. Uh, <coughs> hang on a second, I want to give you some specific. He's looking for positive values that I mentioned on the slide. Which slide was it? Uh, one of the earlier, early ones. You talked about the community values. Um, in in, uh, might have been UAE and Bhutan. Yeah. Uh, included community pride, uh, strict moral or religious code, yeah. and shared vision with three specific yeah. And each of those um, can manifest in repressive form. Absolutely. Uh, and I suspect that, or, or in, um, in the stereotypes that we're all indoctrinated into in a Muslim country, it seems like that oppressive form. Um, okay, that was not in UAE. That was in that was in Bhutan, and in fact, okay. it was uh, it was Buddhism. Yes. Yeah. One of these was UAE. Yeah. It might have been the community pride one. Community pride was uh, definitely in UAE. Yes. And shared vision. Yes, I do believe. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you've got any insights or observations on how these potentially positive values. Um, can also yeah. manifest in those countries in a way that, that we, in, the, in our Western perspective, wouldn't view as positive. Yeah. So let me just say, I, when I reflected on the fact that we had these very low levels of cultural entropy in Bhutan and in UAE, I was rather surprised because I had my stereotype belief structure going, and I thought, well, no, you know, that can't be, that can't be right. And the more I examined the data and the more I talked to the people, I realized it was right. And in fact, um, the Muslim values are absolutely fantastic. It's when it's taken to extremism that it becomes a problem. But that is true of Christianity too. It's true of every religion. And so what I began to realize was it wasn't just about the leadership in these nations that cre created low cultural entropy. It was because of their adherence to values, the spiritual values that came from the religions, or Buddhism is more of a, uh, it's not so much of a religion, but it, it's these religious or spiritual values actually uh, live throughout the nation as well as leaders who care about their people. And I came to the conclusion that is why these nations have such low levels of cultural entropy. There is a tremendous amount of respect for people in the UAE. I noticed that when I was there. Was like everybody respects one another, and particularly respect between the genders. 
it was re really remarkable to see. And as somebody who'd never spent much time there, I had my preconceived notions of what it was about. But no, I, 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 I'm just in admiration of, uh, of what is going on in that country. Even though it's an authoritarian regime, the people who are there, the Emirati, <laughs> you see the results of their assessment. And the visitors see the same thing. Concern for future generations, respect, pride in the community. And uh, so uh, I totally agree with you. When you take these things, sometimes these things to extreme, particularly these religious things, they get really out of hand. But, you know, um, if you go back a few centuries, four or five centuries, um, you know, to the Crusades and those things, I mean, we were doing same, similar things in Christianity that some, some of the Muslim countries are doing right now. Not all of them, but some of them. You know, it's, it's the same thing. Yes, sir? I'd like to ask you about UAE as well again. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, my understanding is very different about the UAE. Okay. I know of uh, many Emirates who are mayors who are, you know, their own Boeing 747s and private uh, cars. In the UAE? Spend their time in Las, Las Vegas and do the shopping in Paris. Okay, these are people in, from UAE? Yeah. Uh, do you know that for a fact? Yes, I have colleagues who are working in those positions. Okay. And this, I, I think it's a matter of perspective, and so I'd be a little hesitant to essentialize it in that way. Okay. So, so how many churches do you see in UAE? Well, what's that got to do with anything? Uh, I'm just talking about the liberal, you know, you know, idea that, you know, every Emirati is moving around contented with the government. Yeah, but the, also the, 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 way it's been the, the, the majority of people living in the UAE are actually not from the UAE. Exactly. And we measured their values and they became exactly the same as the Emirati values. They see exactly the same thing. Yeah. So, and, 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 and I've been there. I've been on TV, I've been on radio, there's freedom of speech, uh, you can go to different churches. It is not a problem. I would really invite you to go there and have a look. You know, uh, there may be, there may be uh, certain rich individuals who fly around in the Boeing jet. I, that may be true, but that's true in Canada, it's true in England, it's true yeah, I'm not here to defend you, eh? it may seem like it. I'm just telling you what I see. And, bef and I, would, I would suggest that before you work on all of these, think you actually go and have a look. And experience it for yourself. Um, I'm just going on the data that we, that we collected. And, uh, and um, these were not people who were you know, fearful about filling in this survey. So, yeah, I just I, I, I just like you to you know question your belief, maybe, and and you know work with facts. Okay. Can I ask you another yeah. About, uh, I mean, you, you say politicians are all of these things. Well, so there are politicians who are kind and generous, and 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 are really good politicians. But that's not what you see. The ones who reach the upper echelons don't seem to be like that. <coughs> Yeah. Which allows it. Are you saying the legal system and government system is defective? I don't know the answer. It's a really good question. I don't know the answer. Certainly everybody in this room would say, yes, democracy is good. But the way that it is practiced by the people, it's been hijacked by political parties and powerful elites who are serving their own self-interest, in my opinion. And these are not high conscious. Some of them are not high conscious. This individual, look at Berlusconi. I mean, here you got, you know, I mean, this is not a high conscious individual who is leading a country. And the level of cultural entropy in Italy was with the highest. Anybody saw that? So, how are these people, how is the system allowing these people to get to these positions of power? That's my question. I don't know the answer. But I do know the solution is leadership development. I do know that the solution is a different way of picking candidates and I perhaps a different system to the party political system which shows many shades of gray which allow you to form coalition governments which have all of these shades of gray in them so that you can be more specific in your voting. 
I uh, said, you know, uh, I, I don't have the answers, but collectively, I think we, we can find them. As long as we think about the principles. What is the principle? We want a values-driven nation. What does that mean? We want the people, what they value, to be the priorities of the government. And we want leaders who are servant leaders who serve the people, not are elected because they want power. Yeah, I'm a little outspoken on this, aren't I? <laughs> but I think it is, I think we, justifiably so, you know, the research from all of the universities shows that like 14 out of 15 Western democracies, the level of trust has been going down, down, and down in the institutions, in the politicians, etc. One over there, then one here, and then one there. Just a question about, you know, when you ask people to fill out these surveys, and you ask them what trust is, uh, I know in my own work that people have very different interpretations of mm -hmm. what that value means. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine when you're looking at other nations and asking what is freedom, they may have a completely different interpretation of what that is. Absolutely. Well, we, we deal with that the same way we deal with it in organizations. What comes out is a top 10 positive values and we see the limiting values. Then we form focus groups. and We say, well, what did you mean? What, what does this mean for you? And we get that drilled down to fully, thoroughly understand what freedom means to people or what bureaucracy means for people. And then we tackle that. Let me give you an example of working with, with a 27,000 person organization. Um, and the, I think it was the second year we did the values assessment. Um, we had hierarchy as one of the top 10 values. And, and the CEO said, my god, you know, we had it last year. We've got it this year. Let's do a focus group on hierarchy and find out what it's about. And so they did several focus groups, discussions, and they found out that hierarchy, the issue of hierarchy was in, in the pay structure. It was a grade system. It was a bank with many different grades, and every six months your grade was reviewed. And so, so the people were making the link between the grade system and hierarchy. So he said, okay, we're going to eliminate the grade system. So I right. well, haven't finished. We'll eliminate the grade system. Next year, hierarchy disappeared. People said, well, what are we going to do? How will we know? He says, you'll see it in your pay packet. OK, so anyway, all I'm saying is, once you've got the results of the assessment, you have to drill down to understand. That's exactly what happened in Iceland. They had two huge meetings of 1,000 people, and they've rewritten the Constitution. So next question. Well, then, if, so how do you compare apples and apples if, if you put the label of hierarchy? It might mean something in one nation, but it might mean something in one different country. Well, that's fine. I'm not concerned. It's one nation at a time. You know, I'm, I'm just presenting results from different nations. And if you want to work with a nation, you work with a nation. You find out what's going on there. OK, so I'm not really concerned about comparing. You know, I can compare cultural entropy, etc. But it's just as like a, it's, it's not scientific, for heaven's sake. It's a way of uncovering what is hidden. And having people having dialogue and discussion around, oh yeah, that's exactly what's going on here. And yeah, and this is what I want. So yeah, we're not here into developing a science. We're here into trying to help people build a community or a culture that has more meaning for them than the one right now. So they're less apathetic and they're more engaged and they're more committed because then they'll be happier. I've got you on my list, but there's somebody over there first. Two people over there first. I might uh, agree that people have become disenfranchised with government. However, does it not become more of a thing of participation by the people and varying responsibility? You said your participation is once every four years. Yeah. Is the onus not upon people to become more involved? Coupled with those we, matters that they can advocate for those well, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, how am I, the, the, the avenues for my involvement are very few. The avenues for my involvement are very few. Uh, um, so I, I'm just saying, let's create, uh, let, let's create a system where we all be able to get more involved. And with, in this day and age where we have computers and we, we can all get on and we can say, yeah, I know I like this idea, I don't like this idea, then we can do that. Well, you know, I know it's in the UK, they're, they're really reluctant to go out to the people and say, 
have a referendum. I mean, we have a referendum once every eight or nine years. And we, but we live in an age where we could do it every week if we wanted to do, so what's the problem? The problem is they're afraid of the answers. That's the problem, because it may not be what that party embraces. They're afraid to go to the people. But in my opinion, that's what the problem is. I get what it means, or what it could mean, when you see the results from organizations with super high cultural entropy and all those potentially living values. When you talk about the United Arab Emirates, and they're already at very low, 12%, 10 positive values in their current culture, <coughs> and yet they're asking you, we want to do this. Yeah. So I know it hasn't happened yet, or it sounds like it is going to happen. Yeah. What? What's going to change? Like, what's going? It's because it sounds like there, are, in okay. many ways, there are already about so, these German organizations. So, what's that's a really good question. What's going to change? So, I don't know what's in the minds of the leaders, but let me try and guess. I think they would be quite happy if, in two years' time, the cultural entropy is still twelve percent. The the number of matching personal and current values may have increased slightly. They want to maintain a healthy culture. That's what they want to do. And that's what happens. And you work in organizations using our tools. I know you do. And when you get the level of cultural entropy down to 10%, these organizations don't say, fine, we've done it. Off we go, finished. They don't do that, do they? No, they say, keep on. Because the environment in which organizations and nations live is constantly changing. And so we need to stay in touch with how people are feeling and thinking about that changing external environment. And the internal environment is changing too. So it's like managing your values. And that's why they want to do it. There's another reason, I think, in the UAE, because they really, uh, there's a sense of uh, creativity and achievement. These were values that came through strongly in the assessment in terms of what people, who people are. And I think that there, there's a sense of wanting to be excellent. And uh, <laughs> I would encourage you to read um, Sheikh Mohammed's book called My Vision. He's the prime minister, he's the vice president. He wrote that book about four years ago. Uh, and I read it just th three weeks ago. It is one of the best books on leadership I've ever read frankly. And he openly discusses the question of democracy and women's rights and everything. He openly discusses it in the book. And, and one of the things I also is quite remarkable there is um, you know, he, he'll show up in, a, he'll show up in a, a shopping center and just start chatting with people. You go to some of the other emirates, uh, it's not emirates, but you go to some of the other Gulf states, um, the leaders go around uh, with you know, six car cavalcades and armies front and back. But he doesn't. So there's a real history there of caring about the people. His father cared about the people. I sound like I'm an advocate for you. I, you know, I, 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 I honestly tell you, I've just been there and I've been really like amazed at what I found. And um, I'm very impressed. Because, I mean, I work it with cultures and values all the time for the last 15 years. It's very impressive. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, I was just uh, thinking about what you said about it is not scientific. And it just bring me a bell thinking it is not scientific, it could be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, there's a statement. If it's not scientific, so, uh, so emotions are dangerous? <laughs> aggregate a value based on more or less what Steve was saying, how to aggregate a value that is difficult to be shared because it is difficult to okay. share the meaning of the value yeah. okay. in a multicultural environment like I'm thinking about a country like where I come from, Where is that? Guatemala. Mm -hmm. There's twenty two different ethnic groups. Okay. And they share different values. Yeah. And if we aggregate the values mm -hmm. then and we develop policies towards an aggregate value, that's dangerous. Okay. So that's a, a belief that you hold. You know, it's a belief you hold. Um, all I would say is that 
uh, and there's some good research on this. Um, Actually, the research on 100, uh, we did research into the values, the positive values of, in 125 different um, countries, and they found they were pretty much, human values were all the same. You know, we are actually connected by our values. What separates us is our beliefs. Beliefs divide, values unite, because beliefs are contextual. Beliefs belong to the context in which you were brought up and the religion you belong to, the country you belong to. Beliefs are contextual. Values come from the human heart. They're what unite humanity. And so we could sit around here and talk about our beliefs forever. Or you could get a group of clerics from different religions talking about their beliefs. They would never come to an agreement. You ask them to talk about their values you would find very, very similar human values. And I would challenge your question about 22 different ethnic groups. When you get down to the humanity, what they value will be very, very similar. We looked at the results of the United, Nation, uh, of the United States, the values results, and we pulled out the values of Republicans, their personal values, and the values of Democrats. Nine matching values out of ten. Their values were the same. It was their beliefs about how to create the future that they want, which are different. That's why we have to focus on values, not on beliefs. So, uh, you know, the, the results that you get from this type of analysis, I say it's not scientific. In a way, it is because we get face validity. When we present these results back to organizations, and we work with thousands of organizations in 70 or 80 different countries, when we feed them back, they go, yep, that's us. Well, of course it's them, because they filled in the survey. It's, it's, like, it's all like holding a mirror. It's like, oh, you want to know who you are? Here's the mirror. And it's shocking sometimes, because their personal values are like at level four, five, and six. The current cultural values are like one, two, and three with lots of limiting values. And their desired cultural values are at four, five, and six. So I say to the leaders of these organizations, so this is who you are, great. And this is what you want, great. How the hell did you create that? Because the culture of an organization is a reflection of the leader's consciousness in an authoritarian regime. And I believe it's also true in nations too the culture of the leaders affects the people. Think of some of the really great leaders. Name one really great leader that you can think of. I mean of a country. <laughs> okay, how about Nelson Mandela? How about Gandhi? He had, they had specific values that brought people together. They didn't divide people. And it's that quality of leadership I think we're looking for. At higher level of consciousness. Watch the movie Invictus if you haven't seen it. I mean, what a wise man that was. He was living higher level values. We don't have leaders like that. We need the evolution of human consciousness to move into the political domain. Anyhow, there we go. Is it that we don't have leaders like that, or that the institution? This, the, the system doesn't seem to allow that to come forth. However, there is nothing to stop people from operating in, who are in leadership operating from integrity and with the authenticity. And but, but you know that means not lying, not cheating. It means a, a system which allows you to vote in a part in a, in a in a political arena with your heart, not with the political party. Wouldn't that be a change? Party politics is, uh, you know, it's a problem. Because it's about power. 
and that's level three consciousness. Most of the people living in Canada are operating at level four and five. And that's what we see in organizations, those authoritarian organizations. We see the leaders are living power. And, um, and the people want, they want the autonomy and the freedom and engagement. And the, they've got the bureaucracy, they've got the lack of trust, they're not trusted. And so the organizations perform poorly. And that's what's happening in our nations too. So anyhow. You've got another question. If I got you've got a lot of questions. It's good. That's good. I haven't got many answers. I just, I just, you know, I just, I don't really have answers. I've just got a bit of extra information that you don't have, and you know, please don't think I know what I'm doing because I don't. My question is about Bhutan. I about what? Bhutan. Bhutan. I recently saw a, uh, a program on it. I'm not that familiar with the country, but it's my understanding that they're actually evolving away from an authoritarian culture to, yes. uh, to some degree. Yeah, the, the, the king is actually saying, yeah, let, let's make it. Right. So how do you think that process will actually affect? I have no idea. I don't know. I can't. I couldn't possibly tell you. I, I don't have this crystal ball. But I, what I do know is, when you look at those, you remember those uh, stages of evolution, becoming viable, independent, bonding to form group structures, group structures, cooperating to create a higher order entity? That system has been going on for billions of years, for the four billion years of planet Earth. That's evolution. And, and what I'm talking about right now is the forefront of evolution. How we govern ourselves is the forefront of evolution. Because evolution went from the physical domain to the conscious domain. And, and democracy was a great idea when we were all ruled by powerful rulers who were full of self-interest. It was a great idea. And now we've got democracy. And it was great, and it got going, and, it, and it's a great concept. But we have to beware that it's high, not hijacked by political elites who are still operating from power. That's the way they talk when we get into power. I ask you, when we are given the privilege of serving the people, doesn't that sound different? You hear that? That's what's wrong. Don't know how we're going to get there, but we will. What kind of correlation is there between companies and the countries they are? <coughs> Uh, not much. Uh, you can have, uh, I mean, you can have really highly evolved organizations in uh, in somewhat authoritarian regimes. It's up to the, each individual owner of every company how he treats the the people that work for him or her. And so you, you I mean, it's a mix match. Uh, there is a, there may be some sort of correlation, but it's, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of put any money on betting one way or another, or whether there was a relationship. I, I wouldn't think so, but there might be. I don't, I don't think so. We, you know, we do work in 60, 70 different countries. And uh, you know, for example, uh, Indonesia, which is not a highly evolved uh, political democracy, I mean, we've got some really high performing comp uh, organizations there that have local levels of cultural entropy. Uh, it's difficult to draw links between national consciousness. Uh, there must be a link somewhere, particularly in, I would have thought in USSR before it became liberalized, there could have been a link there. But then there weren't any private companies there. It was all communist ones. I don't know. Let's not spend any more time on that. Anybody else got anything to say before Marilyn jumps up and closes the evening? Okay, Marilyn, jump up and do what you have to do. <laughs> Richard, and thank you for stepping out and, and taking a big risk. Uh, you know, it's interesting that we have a lot of people saying what you're saying, and you've stepped out and you've, uh, you've, you've given it a little shape, and, it's, it's, uh, it, and, and hopefully it will also be a way that we can think about 
a little hope that goes on to that. Um, I know that it really matters in organizations when we're able to talk about culture. If ever we're able, oh, and I wanted to thank you also for setting the agenda for the next Canadian uh, value survey. <laughs> I hope there are people out there who are interested and that we can pull that together. We've been certainly talking about it and I hope it happens. So I uh, just wanted to say that uh, again, you, uh, we, uh, I guess we don't have to, you can Google Richard's books, uh, go on Amazon. Would it be all on Amazon pretty much? That and Lulu. And Lulu. Uh, uh, we didn't, uh, so we didn't have a stack of them here because people tend to order them. Um, again, uh, Richard's here for a uh, teaching session and uh, with the Values-Based Leadership Certificate, and uh, he's making a huge contribution uh, to our thinking, and and to the broader, a new way to look at leadership. And we have, and we've got one of the largest educational, you know, graduate educational leadership programs, the largest one in Canada, and we're evolving it to include new and different things, and this is one of the big ones. So thanks, Richard, uh, and uh, good luck with the, we want to hear about the UAE coming forward. Yeah. And the UK, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much.